the very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious. We will stay of things, in view of violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics, also sponsored by at Outsideness on Twitter.com. Before we get started with today's guest, just want to throw out I've got a Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash M U H H. Definitely consider throwing me a buck to offset these uh, production costs. But very excited to have my good, good friend, most excellent friend, uh, Taylor Atkins, joining me. Uh, we're going to take a look at primarily the uh, Schraber case that Sigmund Freud wrote about. And uh, maybe draw a little bit from Schraber's own biography. Taylor did read some of that. And maybe we'll end up discussing what anti-Oedipus and, and perhaps even libidinal economy, as both of those works make significant references to the Schraber case. Welcome back to the podcast, Taylor. Thanks for making this suggestion at sort of the last minute. I think we can do something interesting with this. Yeah, of course. This is it's such a rich text. And one thing I'll say before we get deep into it is, you know, having glanced at the memoirs, which in translation, I mean, in the original German, I think it's around 400 pages. I think it's, it's about the same in English. It's about four to 450. So it's, it's a lot. I mean, he's got a lot there. And yeah. in, the, in the memoirs, it's not just his thing, but it's also got some of which was censored, which we'll, we'll talk about later, which is interesting. Freud even brings it up a few times and uh, some of the stuff in the memoirs is censored. And it's possible that some of the material about like his wife or, or, or just really the other women in his life, like his, his mother, that, that stuff might have been censored. Um, it's not certain, but, you know, looking at the memoirs and reading about them, women are, are besides, you know, Schrager's own becoming woman, women are, are mostly absent we do get some references to his wife and stuff but i will say that uh is that is that like self-censorship or would that be no yes in no and schraber is no self schraber is german right yeah schraber's german and they're growing and and it's probably like what uh he would have been writing this at the turn of the century around the time when freud was writing um the traum deutung you know the interpretation of dreams schraber's writing his memoirs I think they're first published in 1903. Apologies. I should know this. It, it, it was basically turn of the century when it's, is when it's published. Well, I was you know, thinking of like what, um, like politically, what was going on in Germany at this time. Because I'm guessing was, this is like yeah. still Bismarck era. It would have probably been the aftermath. I'm not sure it's when like Bismarck would have come out, but, you know, but, but, but it would have been a little bit more, you know, Nietzsche would have just died after his 10 year collapse. You know, Freud's uh, interpretation of dreams will be published, which, you know, it'll take a few years, but by the time he's writing the Schreiber case in 1911, see, this is how I think I can remember dating it. Schreiber's memoirs are published in 1903, if I remember. And it actually makes a little bit of head wave in the not just in the psychoanalytic community, but the psychiatric psychological community, you know, in Germany, at least uh, writ large. And Jung, who uh, specialized in paranoias, kept telling Freud to read it, that it, that it would be worth his while. And this was when Freud and Jung were still tight. You can start to see some of their disagreement coming out in this text from Freud. You know, you start to see he's starting to break or his quote unquote, his children, his analytic followers are starting to break away from him. Jung is starting to break away from, that's not been a full break yet, 
that'll take another few years. But Adler has started to break away, which he mentions in a footnote in here kind of dismissively, which we'll get back to, but that's really important. I think the case itself, why Freud, it took him seven, eight years to like digest it and start to write about it in a, in a way. I think some of this is in reaction to the analytic school. His little following is starting to to break up. And so he's thinking about the future of uh, psychoanalysis as he's given birth to it. I do think there's a lot of Freud in this text that like, like literally, I think Freud is, seeing a lot of himself in Schreber, obviously not in the confinement sense of being like, you know, held against his will, but more so in this notion of giving birth to this new uh, creation yeah. of psychoanalysis. Again, I, I'm just kind of foreshadowing some of that. <laughs> really what I was trying to say is like Freud condenses in part one of this text, the case history, as always, Freud shows himself to be really, really good at these at these case histories, at giving us these big, beautiful morsels and nuggets to work with and breaking these things down. I mean, he obviously doesn't get to every point and for, you know, condensing 400 pages into 20, but he right. really gets to the meat of the matter and gives the reader uh, enough to where, even though he says, hey, go back and read Schraber's memoirs and put my study to the test, not just the case history, but his conclusions and his interpretations but you know one can go back and start to look and see that Freud did did his due diligence in giving us some of the big pieces of the puzzle and so like I think that's just a merit to Freud as a as a writer and why one could still like dive into these things like the Schreber case with you know little to moderate knowledge of of psychoanalysis, specifically right. Freud's own stuff, and, and get yeah. a lot out of it. He mentions a lot the order of things, and I was wondering if that is that's got to be like the inspiration for the Foucault book, right? You know, or is um, the translation the order of different? things is 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 actually the English translation title. The original title is uh, okay. uh, Les Mots and Les Shows, uh, words and things. Oh, okay, gotcha. So, so it's not. And exactly. I almost feel like that's a better title, but, you know, it's, I'm not exactly sure what was going through. I doubt it was just the translators. Um, yeah, I, I assume sense. it was Sheridan, maybe who did it. I, I would have to go back and check. I, I would bet money it was Alan Sheridan who translated it. I doubt it was just like his single idea. I'm sure it was a collective idea to do it this way. And we don't even know if... I mean, would Foucault have been alive? Would he have given that 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 alternative title? So I don't I don't know. Uh, just now, when you say the order, you're talking about the world order or the order of the world. That that no, it was Schreiber... like the Freud reading. He mentions the order of things in the context of this whole sort of uh, like the schematic relations between himself and God. And gotcha. How do you pronounce? Is it Fleshig? Fleshig. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Fleshig. So we. I wasn't could, sure could... if it was like Fleshig. But I guess that would involve yeah. the S- SCH at the. In the middle, yeah. Right? So for the. Like, um, I guess for the listeners, Fleshig is uh, Schraber's primary doctor. And so I'll give His a little bit. Of, physician. Yes. Or... I'll give a little bit of, of history. Not I'm not going to give it all at once, but like basically Daniel Paul Schraber in the late 1880s, early 1890s is, you know, he's become the successful lawyer. He has continue to rise in the ranks. He gets a judgeship and he's doing all this work. He might potentially be overworked. We don't know. Uh, Freud kind of points to to that. And in the memoirs, I assume he mentions it. I haven't gotten that far, but uh, he has in around 1888 to 1890, he has, or maybe even later, it might've been 1893, when he initially has his first illness. And, and Freud describes it as a hypochondria. Right. For his own reasons and whatever, but he starts to have some of these feelings that his body is rotting, and you know some of these delusions that <clears throat> we'll see intensified in the second illness. He self admits, I think, with his hypochondria, or he's maybe encouraged by his wife, and and obviously at this point, yes, he has some uh, some of these these fantasies and these delusions. But it's uh, it's what Freud will want to call hypochondria, and there might not, there's probably not enough in the memoirs 
alone for Freud to have gone much deeper than that. But he lets us know that. And Flesig treats him. And I think it's within a year, he's better. And he goes back. And he himself says that he spent... He literally says on the on the, like the first page of the case history that, or at least Freud has Schreiber say, uh, after I recovered from my first illness, I spent eight on the whole very happy years of my wife, years rich in public honors, and only dim from time to time by the recurrent dashing of our hopes that the marriage might be blessed with children. I mean, Schreiber was in his forties at the time after that first illness, and he's successfully cured by Fleshig, and I, who knows how old his wife was. But they, they don't have any children. But Fleischer's wife is, is like extremely, or sorry, Fleischer, Schraber's wife is extremely happy that his, you know, his doctor, Fleischer, yeah, yeah. cured him. He's grateful. We get that on the first page of the case history, too, that she's so grateful she keeps a, a picture of his yeah. on, on her desk. Which, a likeness, yes. You know, Freud, mm-hmm. Freud is being, he doesn't, Freud doesn't like interpret that. He just like puts that little nugget for us and like, hey, swallow that. Oh, yeah. That right? Is, like, that is interesting. Because, because that is a key info. Right. Especially in this like div- divine comedy or sort mm-hmm. of, I mean, maybe that's not <laughs> the most sensitive way to describe it, but um, in a well, sense, it, yeah, it is like this, this weird like divinity that flight, sh- uh, I want to say flight sig. <laughs> fleshig, think of like fleshig. literally flesh, right? Yeah. Fleshig sort of takes on in, in the second iteration mm-hmm. of, of the uh, paranoia. Right. right? So because eventually actually, like it's yeah. a, it's a paranoia. Yes, right. it, it, even if they at were, least for uh, Freud. Yeah, right. For Freud and following Jung, as I said, who, you know, Freud himself basically said that because he wasn't working a joint to a medical facility, I don't think, I mean, due to bi- biographical details, it's more or less that Freud needed to have his own private practice to support his family. And he did have a big family. He did have a lot of children and um, he was able to, make a living doing that but but uh, th- that's what makes Freud so interesting because that also gave him the freedom to write all the stuff that we have apart from a you know a, a quote-unquote legitimate institution he himself as I said kind of gave birth to his own institution and yeah we can, you know but uh but he but but he was always fascinated with with uh Jung's work in in the before the break right because Jung worked with with paranoids, you know, uh, we could call them paranoid schizophrenics now, or, you know, there's also, um, they had different terminology for what he studied, but this, I think this is partly why Jung follows his track down the road of the, you know, the archetypes and the, and the mythological symbolism and, and all of these things, because that type of effective intensive life you find much more in, in what they were calling the paranoids, the, the, those with paranoia, but Freud didn't deal with those because for him, the talking cure, talking things out and making the associative links was much more suited to, to how transference works with neurotics, with, with paranoids. You know, I don't know if, I mean, Freud basically said himself, he would, he would send them to a medical facility. And I think it's interesting you brought up Foucault because one thing Freud never says even a word about, at least directly and really not indirectly is the type of conditions that Schraber would have been living in when he is hospitalized the second time after eight years, right. he, you know, he goes back and Fleshig is his doctor once again, but, but Schraber is much, much worse at this point. And it's in that interim, the, the eight year interim where he starts to have these fantasies and delusional images of, the how pleasurable it would be to uh, have intercourse like a woman. So he starts down this kind of road of what Deleuze and Guattari might call becoming woman, although we don't need to bring them in here. It's again, if we stick in the Freudian terminology and the Jungian terminology, it's these, these effective, intense, delusional images start to occur within the interim. And so that's kind of what lands. And I think if Schreiber didn't self-admit the first time, I believe he self-admits the second time. Freud wants to make it out that he's overworked and stressed and whatnot, but uh, right. but this gets him back. And but but the thing I was trying to say with reference to Foucault, Foucault would obviously be so useful to bring in to supplement Freud, precisely because Freud never makes even one 
mention of the kind of techniques used in, in that type of establishment to, let's just say, to, to secure Schraber or to make him compliant, right? What kind of restraints were used? What kind of overt torture devices? What, what kind of disciplinary machinery <laughs> and regimens were established? You know, Schraber himself doesn't tell us that much directly because so much of it is translated into this language of what is going on in his kind of psychical life. Right. Anyway, so I wanted to bring that up that that's one thing that to fault Freud for. Oh, but, but again, like that's again, that shows that he's not privy to what goes on at least directly in those medical establishments. As I said, he, he had his own private practice and didn't treat people with the kind of complex that Schreiber had, right? Freud would have known he couldn't have gotten the, the type of work he was used to, the, the talking cure to be any effect. And I guess my point is that there's that Fleshig, the quote unquote doctor, the medical doctor and Freud, the, um, the psychoanalyst, even if he has that a medical background, their conception of how to treat mental illness are virtually diametrically opposed. And so I think that that's important for interpreting some of the fantasies that Schreiber has, specifically the, the, the divine sunbeams and rays, right? That the God, as he kind of says, is, is a whole complex of nerves uh, which are these beams of, of rays, these intensive nerve filaments that suffuse uh, existence, particularly his own body, because part of the delusions he has is that his body is decomposing. He's swallowing pieces of his larynx as he's eating. He's without, he's without intestines. He's literally, he's, his body is, is so decaying that he becomes body, a body without organs, the rays of light, the divine rays, the divine nerves of God are always like instantaneously. Yeah. yeah rege yes. Regenerating him and replenishing him at the same time. Anyway, let's, uh, let's take a step back. Cause we're, you know, I was trying to set some of the, <laughs> the grounds. Did you have any, um, any, any early reactions to the, to the building up of the case history or did you, did you, whatever, whatever you want to start with. A lot of what I was going to kind of like try to tease out was why do Deleuze and Guattari spend so much time in Antiedipus on, on Schreber specifically? A significant portion of the text is devoted to Schreber and then also libidinal economy mm -hmm. makes significant reference to the case, although not as significant as Antiedipus. So right. there was some of that that I was just kind of curious to having not as much familiarity with you know, Antiedipus that I don't know if we want right. to get into that now, but I thought it was interesting to maybe more directly from us through a psychoanalytic lens, like this idea of, of the paranoiac and the yes. different discourses of, I guess, neuroses. Yes. That yeah. Khan discusses is yeah, sort of I, interesting. I think with, I think that I, without going too deep into Antiedipus, as you said, it, it's, it's opening a can of worms, but the, the thing is Freud writing on someone with what he calls paranoia. And I think that perhaps Deleuze and Guattari might say that Schreber is closer to a schizophrenic. Right. I mean, yeah. we can, we can kind of, you know, again, that's so much of the, the diagnostic nosography. It doesn't matter. I mean, the point yeah. being is that like, first of all, obviously we know this wasn't a patient of Freud's. So Freud doing this case history with interpretations and whatnot, he himself kind of says, it's this kind of secondary from afar thing. But it's again, like I said, he wouldn't treat, he wouldn't have treated Schreiber. He would have sent him away to, to a specialist or to a medical institution like the one that Schreiber ended up. And I think that Deleuze and Guattari sees in this moment that which Freud would seem to find averse to normal transferential analytic talking cure uh, methods and so I, so Schreiber is is a is is like a and also just on an even general more general level besides that fact that he he becomes a kind of type he becomes a an archetype if you will for Deleuze and Guattari to say like here's the schizo on a stroll it's 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 Schreiber with you know with the sunbeams up his ass or whatever you know with this intense miraculating religious hyper religious psychical situation that's the schizo on a stroll rather than the neurotic on a couch. But the other thing is uh, it's 
arguable that the Schraber case has been the most widely written about psychical literature, literature of in that realm than any other. And so in that sense, it's, it's, it's just expedient to talk about a case that, that would have the, if you will, some of the widest appreciation and some of the most well-documented and, and researched case in all of psychoanalytic literature. Does that make sense? I guess to Bataille writes the solar anus as well in 27 that is wrapped up in this kind of like the excrement and mm-hmm. kind of waste and stuff. And I think maybe, maybe that's where libidinal economy has, or this uh, Schreber case has purchased in terms of libidinal economy. Yeah. I mean, with, with, with Leotar, we'd have to go back and look and, and see, but it's this, Fleshing becomes this tensor sign, as yeah. as Leotard wants to say, which is you know we don't have to go into, but it but it does function in the case and in his memoirs that that Fleshig is, you know, both a kind of substitute, this delusional substitute for for God, but also this persecuting influence. Yeah, and and we so see what later, was it soul yeah. eating or soul stealing that he? Well, I, the, literally, it's soul murder, right? Soul murder, right? that Fleshig represents as the persecuting doctor, but also this potentially omnipotent, you know, he's got, he's got, he's, he has the last say over Schreber's freedom. So he does, Freud does make a not so far of a logical leap to make, the, he says that there's a resonance between the Fleshig God or Fleshig, uh, Fleshig series and the God series, right? I mean, that's, but that's part of the hyper transference that's going on. When I when I say transference, right, I mean like the uh, the ways in which there is a kind of effective inter there's an effective investment, if you will, on the part of the patient towards the doctor. Now, normally transference is talked about only in the psychoanalytic sitting, right, where mm-hmm. you're in analysis. But I think that it still holds for what Freud's trying to do that he wants to say there would have been this super abundance of, you know, importance placed on the doctor's being, you know, first of all, he's, he's already been cured by flesh at once. Right. So, you know, this is how Freud can manipulate the, the persecutor at one point was also the, the loved one or the one who was filled with love. And you see that in the analytic situation too, right. That, that the analyst has that duality and in, in transference between the subject that the patient is trying to win over, if you will, right? Like to, to get approval of and, and to find love in, but, and therefore espouses these feelings of love towards the analyst, but at the same time can see the analyst once the resistances are start, that once that little kernel of resistance, you know, in the repressed zone is starting to get centered on, uh, as, as you get closer to that, the analyst starts to become more and more of a persecutor, right? At least with, I would assume even in cases of neurosis, but specifically more so in cases of paranoia. And I think that Lacan's very important here because with paranoia, the one thing that Freud, reason why I keep saying paranoia is this, the intensity and the quote unquote reality of these hallucinations, these delusions that Schreber has, whether of becoming a woman and growing a vagina and, and being filled with God's rays to, you know, and, and, and therefore to, uh, you know, that there has been this collapse of the world order and have to give birth again to uh, a new humanity. All of that is lived intensely by Schreber. There's no reason to doubt he's just making all that shit up, that he is living through it. And, you know, Lacan says what's rejected in the symbolic returns in the real, right? And that's what, how he kind of defines, at least that's how he uses it to define psychosis, um, which is not the words that Freud uses here, but that's that's probably just again a uh, again a question of nomenclature. And so, what's what is rejected? One of the things that's rejected is what we see in that very first page of the case history, right? The very fact that Schreber's brother has died, which again is part of this case history. His brother commits suicide, and that was his only other brother. Um, his father has has passed away in a kind of depressive state. So Schreber not having children, that's the, that's the end of the line, right? That's the end of the Schreber line. That's the extinction of the line. It's the same tension that happens in the Odyssey, right? Odysseus has to get back 
to save his son. And there's some weird curse on the family that there can only be one son. So the lion has to be saved. And, and so you could say that that's that rejection of the idea uh, of Schraber comes back in this fantasy of giving birth to a, to a whole Schraber humanity, if you will, right. That he will be the, the female redeemer of the, of the human world and repopulate it with God's rays, semen, spermatozoa. (laughs) Um, And, and I mean, that's the easy reading of showing how what's symbolically rejected from the unconscious or repressed, if you will, into the unconscious, that notion of the Straper line is dead to this fantasy of repopulating nothing. I mean, then, I mean, with, with his fantasy, it's everyone, it would be a Straper, right? The whole kind of Abraham complex, right? That, that God promises Abraham, you know, the, all of his children. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it is pretty interesting to look at this through that kind of like lens of the Lacanian registers. It kind of touches on all three. Yes. In terms of at least, in terms of paranoia, I guess. Although I don't Mm -hmm. know like enough to know if like where Lacan and Freud line up in terms of what paranoia is for each of them. But I would assume it's relatively stable or. Yeah, I mean, you, you have, you do have all the registers sort of fully engaged with the, with the Schreiber case. And, and Lacan talks about it in various seminars. He, he even talks about it in the first one in seminar one, brings it up, you know, in developing these ideas about foreclosure and, and other things. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, we can leave Lacan to one side for now. I do think the other thing, the other little bit of look, tiny little piece of information about Schreiber's father, which we don't get too much of, from Freud is we get a little bit of knowledge from Freud, but he doesn't expand on it too much. But Schreiber's father was, was a very famous man and wrote over 30 books on specifically like childhood health and hygiene and gymnastics and these methods of correction of bodily physical engagement and and he developed different mechanisms and machines for, you know, for like upright posture and specifically one, if I remember correctly, that kind of strapped the child's head into a chair and prevented masturbation, like kind of <laughs> masturbation Jesus. aid. So, so that part of the history too is, has only been reconstructed outside of the memoirs in the case this notion of uh, the Schreiber father as, if not sort of cruel in any negative sense, being highly strictly like hyper domineering yeah. in that sense, right? And and s- to such an extent that there's literature about the hypothesizing about the kind of um, uh, mechanisms that his father would have potentially used his children, you know, he and his brother as the guinea pigs for, right? The, the different, you know, and so, and so, and so in, in, and the reason why this is important is there's a nice little detail that Freud is only able to work with a, a little bit or, or comes back to again and again, but not to fully unpack is um, Schreiber gets very, uh, very angry at one of the doctors. It may be Weber who is a secondary doctor, or it may be an orderly, the, the flesh eggs like top guy, but Schreiber gets annoyed when that that man accuses him of, of of having like a masturbation fetish or, you know, I say fetish. I mean, uh, masturbating more, say, frequently than, you know, especially for crazy people. You got to keep them, you know, and, and, and you got to look over the, that kind of sexual activity, I suppose, you know. And so he gets he gets angry about that. And there's there's this notion that this this refers back to the horror he would have felt due to you know who knows freud would say that his dad caught him masturbating or whatever and strapped him into that that machine for however long it took to to cure him of that <laughs> but of course freud instead since he doesn't know that or doesn't mention the that those 
technical machines to prevent masturbation. He wants to make, he'll usually want to make masturbation into this thing about that you're not supposed to masturbate because you'll go blind or, you know, you, you, it'll fall off. He always turns it back into the castration complex stuff. And I think it doesn't necessarily work as well for Schraber here because he's ideating about becoming woman, mm-hmm. fantasizing about being seduced by God, etc. So in that sense, losing the male organ would have been a, a, a first step to becoming yeah. God's wife. Part of the process, right. Right. Yeah. This is not a huge reveal or anything like that, but just early on, whenever Freud says that this investigation, the psychoanalytic investigation of paranoia um, is there's a certain impossibility of it as far as in being able to be investigated because of the peculiarity of those like neurotics would keep this stuff a secret, whereas right. the paranoiac, I guess, verbalizes or manifests these sorts of, uh, I don't know if you want to call them delusions or not, but. Visions that's or... the word he that's the word he would have used hallucinations delusions you can use either one i think for freud yeah i think that's 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 really interesting he's he's kind of saying look if schreber were just a neurotic he wouldn't have written a memoir about this about uh, yeah. this that's a this. good point too and <laughs> he wouldn't have he wouldn't have revealed the very i mean sometimes devastatingly humiliating right details of his fantasies right about being too stupid to shit right this this notion of having to shit being this huge burden, almost this test, right? That like God was miraculating into his body and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's some of the stuff that Leotard talks about too. Yeah. You know, the, but, but, but yeah, I think Freud's right. It, it, it is a paradox, right? As I said, Freud wouldn't have treated Schreber a paranoiac yeah. and yet as literature, he can go back and say, like, oh, it's a good thing that paranoiacs just tell it like it is. They keep it 100, <laughs> right. no matter how insane it sounds. Because neurotics, one of the symptoms of a, of a neurotic would have been not to reveal that. Yeah. To be able to, to, to have repressed that. And it's not that Straper only revealed these thoughts in his writing. His, his doctors appended to the memoir some of the cool stuff about the the memoirs is at the end, you do have some of these medical attestations to Schreber's, you know, how, how he, he should be released because even despite these fantasies, he's, he's, he's intelligent, his memory is intact. He's able to make rational decisions, et cetera. I mean, even at the very beginning of the case history, Freud talks about Schreber's second doctor, this guy named Weber, because I assume either Fleshig was retiring or maybe Fleshig realized that he may have cured Schreber the first time, but he's not having success the second time. So, so Schreber gets a new doctor, and and it's that new doctor also that re- writes the testimony to release him that you find as an appendix. So it's interesting that maybe Fleshig thought he could he could cure him of the paranoia and gave up. I don't know, but uh, what Weber says. Schreber's pathological ideas are a quote unquote complete system. And that his ideas are not amenable to negotiation. You can't convince Schreber with facts, so to, so to speak. Apparently, Schreber's feelings matter more than, than facts. So mm-hmm. this, I think, I think Weber is in, Weber's interesting because he says something like Freud would say, that like this, and this gets back to the Lacan, you know, the rejected and the symbolic comes back in the real. This this notion that his hallucinations, his illusions, even as crazy as they are, they have a logic to them. I mean, they have they have a um, they have a as he said a systematic quality, and even if you can you can try to attack that system, you can try to attack elements of that system, and even if even if there's a logical part of Schreber that understands that. It's not enough to override the intense lived experience that he knows to be true because he's he's felt it, he's been it. And so I find that fascinating because that gets us to something we talked about when we discussed Beyond the Pleasure Principle, which this notion of reality testing. And so the complete system of ideas that he has as a psychotic or a paranoic or a schizophrenic, whatever you want to call them, they 
defy any sort of reality testing or reality principle. They are unto themselves a kind of self-sufficient system that have the, that has their own reality, and that. And so, I think f- what's fascinating is that for Schreiber to recover and to and to become better, better enough to to heal him, it's not to say no, you're not, you're not woman, you're not you're not, you know, f- being fucked by God, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually to get him out of the fucking asylum and give him more external contact with the world. You know, it's little things like getting letters from his family with postage stamps that he recognizes, or like handwriting he recognizes and, and it logically he knows can't be faked. That connection with the external world is what allows him to start to the intensity of the fantasies and delusions of Bates, even if they're, they're still there, they're there enough for him to write them, them down and to tell them, but they're, they're, they abate enough for, for him to, uh, you know, for him to, to interact normally, more normally, whatever the fuck that means, right? I thought this little anecdote was pretty amusing, although I'm sure it was pretty hellish for, for Schreiber to go through, but right. the way that he has, Freud talks about this little this little anecdote about how he would pronounce little flight fleshig with yes, putting little- a sharp, like putting that sharp stress on the first word. It reminds me of kind of like this, um, this almost stereotypical over the top German accent of, of like Dr. Strangelove pronouncing mm. little, fl- little fleshig, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'd have to look at the German, but I wonder if it's a, uh, if it's Klein, Klein fleshig, you know, just, <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, I, that that's. I mean, obviously, Freud again doesn't say anything more about this, but it, for for him, you can imagine in in him talking about the transference or dealing with patients, you know, the attacking the a better way to say it is, you know, him attacking Fleshig to his face. We know later that with his intense relationship with God and his the things he says about God, that God doesn't learn from experience that right. he only knows dead people that he doesn't, he's, he's that God is stupid when it comes to, to living, the living right. to people. I mean, we can see there's a complex web of associations with fleshig too, right. Being little fleshig, as he says, as, as I think Schreiber says like he alone due to his divine connection has the right to, to mock God, to, to make jokes about him and to, and to, call him stupid so i think this is part of it too right calling fleshy little belittling him oh uh, yeah uh, yeah i got and, you that's, that's, i didn't even think about that connection and there's and there's something similar too with perhaps it also goes back you know as, if we're going to be good freudians it, it, it would ultimately relate back to mocking the father that hyper authoritarianism that hyper fascination with raising youth and good youth which we know will be a theme with the nazi youth later I'm not calling Schreiber's father a Nazi, but that that tendency, that hyper tendency with uh, with masculine youth and vigor and energy, and you can't, you shouldn't masturbate because that's degenerate or that's uh, you know wasting your your life energy, whatever. You know, I think that Schreiber too, when he says God doesn't learn from experience or doesn't know living bodies, only corpses, I think it is also a kind of denunciation of his father, of his father's what Traber would say, failure to be this hyper kind of eugenicist, hyper hygienicist of the male or the child body and like got to make a good ward of the state, if you will, right? So I think too that that's to be a good Freudian, we'd have to say that every time he's mocking Fleshig or mocking God, there are these little elements of the of the father. And it, you know, and it's, for Lacan, it's structural and it wouldn't even be about the biographical father Schreiber, but yeah. you know, I think with Freud, he, he would want to have it. Almost. He'd want to have it both ways because he would want to know. And I think Lacan too, if he were dealing with the patient, he wants to know. He wants to reconstruct a history. It's just where you put the accent, right? You know, Lacan will make it structural. Will make it about these 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 chains of signifiers. And I think Freud is Freud would want us to to have all the biographical details too. Right, that that would be a part of the. You can obviously say that Freud may sometimes go too far, right? And that's where he that's where he 
sometimes mistakes history or the quote unquote real history with the fantasy and waivers on which to give more precedence. Isn't one of the, I guess, Freud's diagnosis is that this, this whole, I guess, this whole set of hallucinations or delusions is based on this displaced sexual desire for the, for the father and the brother. Yeah. He'll want to say that, that Fleshig is a stand in for the father. Right. And if not the brother, right. Uh, Yeah. Okay. Which he, which he, he, he wavers on because if the brother is younger than Schraber, then there's some different. Yeah consequences if he's older he already has that ego ideal that secondary father figure type yeah um freud himself in a footnote says like i wish i wish we knew how old his brother was and i think if there's i think there's a footnote that says that he was two years older than schraber if i recall correctly so i think uh, literally he was vindicated there's a footnote somewhere i I would assume that was strachey's footnote i don't have the standard edition i've been reading the penguin that's too bad that they didn't steal that footnote but yeah that that's that's a good point that's that's a very important point to make about you know he has his older brother two years older so he would have had part of that ego ideal he would have had some of that i mean because what 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 freud wants to say is is that homosexual cathexis that there's this homosexual charge that involves that series of brother father fleshig and two freud has a problem there's a moment in the text where he first puts that idea out right that there is this homosexual charge this homosexual transferential affect that Schraber has for Fleshig this uh, and and then he'll he'll say Fleshig is is the father Fleshig is Fleshig and God and then Fleshig God father there's this holy trinity of Freudian interpretation but but when he first makes that point he quotes Schraber in a way that would totally demolish the singularity, the, the, the unification he's after, because Freud, uh, he puts it this way. It's not that he's, Schraber thinks there's this plot to make him subservient to Fleshig, his doctor, in such a way that he will be uh, raped. He will be sexually abused by his doctor. Mm-hmm. And this is where Freud's like, oh, yeah, duh, it's the father, it's homosexual libido. But the passage he quotes is, you know, he's transforming into a female body. He's going to be abandoned to the person in question, fleshing, which then becomes God later. But he actually says in that same passage that he's going to be left to the orderlies, that there are presumably these male orderlies in the asylum to whom he's first going to be uh, left as though into as though to a gang rape. And Freud completely ignores that that multiplicity part. It's the same um, it's the same kind of condemnation that Deleuze and Guattari have in one or several wolves, right? That Freud will want to take the wolf pack, turn it into the lone wolf, and then make the lone wolf the father. Freud kind of does the same thing here with making it all about fleshy God father. Mm-hmm. Whereas Schraber's first initial fears of being sexually abused are being thrown to these orderlies, literally in like this gang rape fantasy. And Freud doesn't know what to do with that. He both cites it and doesn't say a word about it. So it's like the perfect kind of repression, if you will. <laughs> Interesting. I think it's the same thing with, um, you know, with Freud having this feeling that he's Papa psychoanalysis uh, and he has to keep his, his, the, he has to keep his old little cohort in line. He has to keep Jung re- <laughs> reminding Jung that, no, there's a sexual component to all, you know, pathology. He has to remind Adler that, you know, it's not just about masculine protest. There's all, you know, there's all kinds of, that's, that's secondary, right? He has to, he has to argue with rank that, no, the primary anxiety isn't, isn't birth trauma, right? Et cetera. So, as this is what I was saying earlier. I see Freud kind of identifying with Schreber. And so you see there's a kind of repression where he's, Freud himself is like thinking he's being raped by his, by his male uh, students, by the, the guys that are his disciples, let's mm-hmm. say. And so I also see Freud, you know, envisioning that he's, his birth of psychoanalysis and taking it 
through its initial stages and making sure, protecting it from the outside, kind of keeping kayfabe, making sure that the, the business isn't exposed and people aren't just practicing psychoanalysis and all these these flimsy ways and ways that are that are that deviate from his central authority, right? So he wants to ensure that Freudian reproduction of the psychical universe, kind of like Schreber. It's just that Freud being I thought that Freud's smarter than Schreber. We know that Schreber is super smart. It's just Freud's penchant for <laughs> for his fantasies and his delusions and his authoritarian, you know, care and concern he has for his baby. I think that Freud lives it out in a way that and writes about it in a way that 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 is totally different, right? He's he's kind of projecting in a way, is what I'm saying. He's taking Schreber's own projections and like layering it, them into his his projections and his concerns. Is that like a counter-transference? Loosely, but... Or is that related for, to transference at all? Like, or am I, we, to, we am I totally loosely, off? No, no, no. I, I think we could loosely say it, you know, I, in, the, in the broader sense. Yeah, it is a kind of, but since it has to do with a whole group of subjects, diverse subjects and disciples, you know, it'd be almost more like saying like a tension between a sublimation and a counter sublimation, right? This, mm -hmm. this, this whole homosexual cathartic energy is circulating in the group as a whole in, in all of his disciples and his followers and his, in all of those who go into making sure that psychoanalysis as an institution can be uh, disseminated, right? If we want to use these, these images <laughs> and, yeah. you know, but Freud didn't talk about counter transference a lot, but the, the most direct way to talk about it is, Again, in the analytic session, in the actual analysis, although you bringing it more broadly is, is I think is perfectly fine. But like technically in the, in the situation, the analyst and the analyst, the doctor begins to, you can say project back, but, but it begins to also invest the situation, invest the, the patient in a way with his effective charge. Mm -hmm. Right. And so Freud when he does talk about it very, the very few times he talks about it, it's always, you know, like in the, um, in the Dora case, he's, he's basically like, Oh, I didn't realize that this could happen. I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't prepared. It kind of hit me from, from behind. And so the other papers on technique that he talks about, it's, it's, it really is for, for Freud. It's like, you know, you have a few ways to deal with the patient falling in love with you, which he says is inevitable. And when he says falling in love, it's that's transference. So the doctor has a few ways to deal with it. You know, he can, he can fall in love right back with him, right. Which due to professional and moral standards and also to get the cure actually working that Freud argues against that, you know, and it's like, that's eh, not a good idea. The second thing is to uh, completely ignore it. And I think that Freud, you know, if, if Freud were to speak like Sartre, it would be kind of like, that would be in bad faith. And that would leave aside a kind of perfect lever for the cure. And so the third way is obviously the one that's beset with the most danger, but that requires the most caution you know, and it is to obviously be aware of it, that it's happening and not to even partially give in to the reciprocation of those feelings, which is what's being sought after, right? What's being sought after in the transference love relationship is, is a kind of validation from the analyst that they are also loved and that that love should be reciprocated and the analyst has to has to be able to tactfully deal with that and put it to good use right into you know for for Lacan it's that's kind of one of the critical moments of the of the of the analysis and I think for Freud too and so you can botch it you can easily botch it and you know and so and so it is you know you can't ignore it or repress it you can't validate it right you have to you have to sort of take it step by step. And I think Freud was, was trying to do some of this in, in, in these early days when it's the unit is start is barely starting to fracture, but you'll see in a few years around 1914 plus he becomes more and more polemical with the disciples that are breaking with him. He becomes more and more on the surface. I think in here we see a kind of more depth. Yeah. Uh, we see in depth Freud's, 
anxiety, yeah, his, his he, fear. He um, references Jung three or four times. Right. Two or three. Right. I think, I think the, I think he even gives Jung credit. He does. In the postscript perhaps, or he gives you credit the several, writing. several points and, 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 and even kind of mentions that uh, Jung is much more suited for analyzing these types of people, right. That he's specialized in. So he, he does, he is very, uh, I think generous there. And you'll see this in other texts too. But just as generous as he can be with his students and what they've taught him, he'll um, he'll also be polemical and yeah. uh, and try to. It's almost like browbeating the that you know you have the ninety nine sheep and the one you go out and search for it. You try to bring it back to the flock, and there's something like that, but less benevolent, more uh, <laughs> more like I'm gonna I'm gonna say why you're wrong. Yeah, you know directly, you know, and so for that too you know, it's a double-edged sword. He's going to be sharp either way and try to keep it out in the open. But there's one thing he says to Yoon, and you can see this in the Schraber case. You know, he's, you know, as I mentioned already, Freud's trying to keep Jung emphasizing that the sexual nature of the, of the pathologies are, especially like the sexual history is like paramount. He may not say reduce everything to sexuality, but he's like, don't forget that kernel. And Jung because Jung is already starting to emphasize these other aspects. And so Freud says that, says to Jung in a letter, the one thing I'm worried about with the future of psychoanalysis is that it will be flooded on all sides by a kind of occult mysticism. And that's really, I think like Freud's rationalism, if we want to like, if we want to specify it out, you know, you know, he's, He's constantly wanting psychoanalysis to have aspects of a scientific method, right? Have standards of application, even if we don't have them today in the most definite forms to always be willing to uh, revise and reject and to instantiate some, some protocols to eventually have a kind of more scientific way of expositing and practicing it so i think this is this is the tightrope he walks in the interpretation of dreams because it's precisely dreams can be they they would be in in all of our psychical lives the most occult mystical kind of source of inspiration and for him no there's a logic to them the brain is doing something you know there are a multitude of of sources for dream inspiration but the mind is actually working and mm. producing something and if you lose that kernel then you you kind of fall back into a mysticism and i think that that freud too is he's worried about that analyzing people's problems would just be a kind of folklore that's that's his big worry interesting i mean i have uh, before i forget i something that interested me about this whole discussion of of uh, of god i think was mm -hmm. was quite interesting. I thought it reminded me a lot of like this uh, Lovecraft, the sort of Lovecraftian pantheon. Okay, yeah. Because isn't it like, I mean, I was fascinated by this idea that what really maybe, maybe the most exciting thing for me of the whole case was that discussion of God doesn't understand the living. Yes. He only understands corpses. Yes. Which had, I don't, I don't just think that is incredibly interesting and yeah it just made me think to i think it's as a thought that is the idiot god that's sort of like if they ever wake up um then the sort of world would or the universe would be destroyed or something like that so it's sort of interesting this yeah. idea of the gods as not the it, you know what i mean it's contra to this sort of enlightened vision of god that christianity has you know there's a certain order or right it's that image of the father that and the big other kind of right that provides structure and order versus this other idea of God as well. God, like an idiot God that there's like a capriciousness because of how simple and not intelligent, let's say, right. The deities are. Yeah. There's something about uh Schreber's God too, where you're right. He is, he is an idiot God for Schreber. You know, he because I remember because he makes fun of him. Yeah, he like, does. And like he says, I'm the only, 
you mentioned earlier, he was like, I'm the only, I have like the special place to where I can criticize or make fun of God. Right. And a lot of it is tied to this way that God doesn't understand the living and can sort of revisit these same um, persecutions or like, I guess, strategies on Schraber, right? Because I think even Freud notes this in the case discussion, right? Yes. He doesn't learn from experience, as you said. He only talks to God. And, and, and for Schraber, it's only after death that God communes or has literally has intercourse with, with, with humans. It's only after they're dead. But he makes this exception. He, he kind of says that unless they are great people, yeah, right? yeah. Unless, unless they're a Goethe or as we're obviously to assume, again, there's no reason to doubt that he, that he had these visions, these delusions, these hallucinations, that Schreber too would be a great person. And so it's, it's these rare, yeah, that's the rare occasions, yeah. right. These rare monumental occasions where um, God reveals himself to the, mm -hmm. to the living, I guess would be the, it reminded me, like, I think specifically Azathoth is the sleeping god, okay, like cosmic god that if you, if they woke up, they would destroy, like everything would be destroyed. Yeah, a deity in the Cthulhu mythos and dream cycle series where Lovecraft, other authors, he's the ruler of the outer gods and may be seen as a symbol for primordial chaos. There you go. So there's this interesting thing where, as you, as we pointed out, it's only through notable persons or as this uh, rare exception that God intervenes in the world or has intercourse with human souls. And for Schraber, God is all nerve. There is something interesting, you know, about this. I mean, the divine yeah. rays, which are not just the sun's rays, but seemingly like everywhere, just a fusing. We could do a 19th century deep dive into science and look at the state of science at the at the time, the 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 most cutting edge, the way of describing, you know, one could say like a kind of post-Kantian way of thinking about reality in terms of neurons firing, et cetera. Yeah. And and so the but then there's also we know there's communication signals along nerves, and that's how the body works, et cetera. So so Schreiber is his delusions, or or at least his way of describing, because as he as he says at the very beginning, like, look. I can't, I, a lot of this shit is indescribable, but I'm going to use human language best as I can. And so it's obvious for, uh, Schreber is working with a kind of, maybe not dated today, but, but it, it's a very specifically concretely located verbalization of all this stuff that, that does reflect some of the advances in, in the sciences in that past century. So God is all nerve, right? God is all divine rays. His body is nowhere, so to speak, right? He's not he's not a big man in the sky, even if he is still ascribed to kind of male gender. But then it's more than that, right? That there is an upper and a lower God. And this is where some of the weird anti-Semitism comes in. And also that proto-Nazi talk, right? That the upper God is like the Aryans, the light skin races, and then the lower God, you know, the Semitic races. And it's, isn't there like high German and low German? I think that's more due to now. I, I have to look back. I, this may be I may be wrong, but I, I thought this had to do with the different developments uh, in the German language uh, from those living in the valleys to those living in the mountains. So I thought it was an elevation thing, um, but I could be wrong. I don't know if "low" means vulgar right. in the sense in which we would understand vulgar Latin, you know, to be this kind of hodgepodge bastardization of classical Latin. I have to look that up. That's a, but you're right. Yes, there is high and low German. Yeah. At, at least there was in the, in the past. Okay. So yeah, it is basically obviously a dialect, mm -hmm. a dialect related to how consonants are pronounced basically. Makes sense. I'm sure just different evolutions of the, of the language. Yeah. Um, Which I guess is not, not really relevant to kind of. No, no. I mean, I, I was wondering I think, if there was perhaps some type of, I don't know, metaphorical element that I'm was sure playing that itself that, out. <laughs> just that, just just those binaries, right? High, low, upper, yeah. lower. I mean, that, that, that itself is fascinating. And, you know, in the memoirs, and Freud even brings it up, you'll see some of the stuff that 
Deleuze and Guattari talk about in, in A Thousand Plateaus, or, or well, both in A Thousand Plateaus, but really in anti Oedipus, when they talk about the unconscious is populated by by races, peoples, that that's the first thing that delirium raves about. And you can see this with Schreber, right? Not just with the divisions of God and upper and lower Aryan and Semitic, but I think it's later, I think it's in part two when Freud tries to give an interpretation. It's like on the second page where he says, Santiago or Carthago, Chinese Zentum or Jesus Christum. He's quoting Schreber talking about these, these different variations on, on the races and, and whatnot. And I think that, that this, this whole notion of the, the, world's, the world's been destroyed, whether it be in a plague or a flood or just, or just what Schreber calls moral rottenness, that like the fucking, you know, modern world is so degenerate and rotten. It's just, it's just decayed. And, and, and the only human forms he, he, that are around him that are persecuting him are what he calls fleetingly improvised men, these kind of phantoms. He imagines that he will give birth to the future humanity, the Schreber humanity. And, and that honestly, isn't that like the most kind of fascistic, Naziistic, like, right. yeah, thing to, but to it, kind of, well, yeah, but it, to this becoming woman and then giving birth to, to the future of all humanity, these, it's just a Schreber race. It's literally yeah. like the way he phrases it. There's something very, I mean, I don't want to, I guess calling it fascist not, Nazi isn't right because it's not attached to any political organization. He's not even saying I'll be the fucking king, right? Because he's he's wife he's the god he's the wife of God. And pro- provisionally, as Freud himself even says about a lot of animals, after procreating with God, he can then go die. You see that in a lot of insects. You I see ha- that in yeah. I have an interesting fictional connection that I can make here. Yeah, go ahead. So in the book series, like the Dune series, as you move further on into like God, Emperor of Dune. So you have the initial three books, basically Paul, who is this messianic figure. They ended up, they do have the Jihad that Paul becomes effectively the new emperor of the known universe. And then in the next books, it's exploring like, okay, this exploring this relationship of sort of political power and these large scale political movements. And eventually Paul's son becomes animal, like he merges with the sandworm, which gives him like this incredible lifespan of like something like, you know, basically he can live for like a a thousand plus years. He's effectively like a demigod at this point. And so what he does is moves, manipulates bloodlines, manipulates all this stuff to occur. Right. So that his own, he even like manipulates his own death so that basically his death will lead to the rebirth of the sandworms on Arrakis. Water is extremely poisonous to the sandworms of, of Arrakis. Like it's, it's effectively their poison. It will kill them. And so he, the plot to kill him is basically he's going to be traveling over this bridge and the bridge gets blown up and he like falls into the water. And that's like how he's supposed to die. And when he does fall into the water, he gets turned into all these little sandworms that go and repopulate Arrakis with the spice creating sandworms. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And this is like a thousand years in the future from the events of the first novel. Well, no, that 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 actually accords very well with, yeah. with Schreber and um And know. it is this very like authoritarian sort of, mm-hmm. you know, father mm-hmm. knows best type right. of plan to basically set up the material conditions of the universe so that humanity can flourish and so forth without becoming stagnant and et cetera, et cetera, is like a long and short of it. I don't want to get too far into it, but no, I don't know. That's immediately kind of what it made me think as far as this project of progeny of the divine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that that's great. I, I, I like that. I, I think the Schreber is doing something very, very similar just without the, obviously the political yeah. overtones and also uh, in, a, in a way in which, Getting back to that fantasy we, we talked about that in the very beginning, not being able to give his wife a son or yeah. a child. Right. And therefore, the last resort is becoming the wife of God, the, the, you know, the female source for all of future humanity, which he assumes has been devastated. Mm-hmm. It's not just homosexual libido. It's not just like, it's not just that. It is also giving up the role of father, right? Now, the, one, the last thing you would call Schraber would be father. Mm-hmm. 
you know, he, he, he's given up that possibility. And so the, the only thing he can be is mother. And, um, you know, I think that, again, you go to someone like Otto Rank for, for this, who wrote about birth trauma as the primary trauma and who wrote about, I believe it was Rank who wrote about Cronus swallowing the children, etc. There's this whole thing with Freud where he overemphasizes the father's role in procreation and he fails to see the, you know, he wants to talk about penis envy, right? For the, the, the girl undergoing the, the Oedipus complex, but he fails to, even when sometimes he's good at, at, at treating, you know, the male and female parts in, in each human, he fails to see that the, that the boy, the male undergoing castration complex also has a kind of pregnancy envy. He's, he's envious of, of the life-giving aspects of woman. And Freud could use more, I mean, this is where obviously a lot of feminist literature would come in and be very helpful for supplementing Freud uh, and correcting him on some of these things. And um, again, I think Freud himself has this unconscious notion where he is this female progenitor of psychoanalysis, right? I mean, he, he's, he's not just disseminating like, like the father, but he's, he's trying to give birth to something new and he's trying to, he's trying to have it both ways. The quote you have pulled up here is great, by the way. The Which psycho- one on page 18? Yeah. He says, the psychoanalyst in the light of his knowledge of the psychoneuroses approaches the subject with a suspicion that even thought structures so extraordinary as these and so remote from our common modes of thinking are nevertheless derived from the most general and comprehensible impulses of the human mind. And he would be glad to discover the motives of such a transformation as well as the manner in which it has been accomplished. The only thing I would say about that is it gets back to my point about Freud being a, being a rationalist mm-hmm. and, and it's, and it's, it also does, uh, he sounds like a scientist here. He's trying to say as crazy as Fraber may seem, there's a basis for, for it. And it's not, it's, you can't just say it's crazy. Normal people wouldn't do this. Freud's like, no, we all have these, we all deal with these impulses and shit. And, but we, not all of us succumb to, to this type of, formation this type of psychical complex uh, i like that that he's it's just like he he wrote in the three essays on sexuality he wants to say normal people normies they have a whole range of perverse drives that for whatever reason they've sublimated you know and they've they deal with on their own so to just to just say they're abnormal pathological doesn't doesn't bring us any scientific knowledge actually it's more rational to say that no, the, the most perverted pathological subject is processing impulses that are, that are common to each of us. I mean, that's the critique of desire, you know, that Lacan says Freud instituted, right? To go back to libidinal economy, do I, I remember correctly that Schreber or maybe, or at least Freud uses the language towards fleshig of prosecutor um is it not persecutor uh, yeah okay so that's okay never mind it was no, no, you're good. right yeah that, yes fleshig is the persecutor gotcha right. okay uh, yeah i was wondering if for some reason I, w- I couldn't remember if it was persecutor or prosecutor i just was thinking that might have had some relevance to the old man Marx and young girl Marx stuff yes. that leotard gets into but i don't i that's no no, no <laughs> that's, I, I i had a note on that I'll have to look for it. Yeah. Um, It's in the attempts at interpretation chapter. I won't make you pull it up, but um, he says, right. He says that one of the key features of paranoia is the delusions of persecution. Yeah. And Deleuze and Guattari also kind of use paranoia in that sense as well, that there's this, that the persecuted body, the persecuted individual under paranoia I think they call it the celebratory machine, right? That they want to decathect or, or, or disinvest all of from the external world. This is partly why Lacan, again, says the rejection of the symbolic returns in the real and hallucination. It's about this relationship with the external world. And why I said kind of earlier that when Schreber finally gets transferred to another doctor with potentially, I assume, a little bit more 
sunlight, a little bit more freedom <laughs> in the external world is able to slowly start to reinvest, right? Start to start to connect outward, out from his own highly, I mean, because what Freud would want to say is like, you know, this super intense homosexual libidinal charge that Schraber can't dispel gets hyper connected onto the ego and this narcissism, yada, yada. That's why the becoming woman, that's why the delusions of, of growing a vagina, of losing the organs, like swallowing the larynx and, and the intestines and all this shit and, and being miraculously re regenerated. And then the, the strange super enjoyment that Schraper feels when he has to shit but in this, again, in this paranoia, par- persecuting way, whenever he goes to the bathroom, it's always occupied. And he has this wish to demiraculate the shit in his bowels, right? To kind of counter miraculate the shit that he um, assumes the divine race of God has filled him with, these little shit babies. And he gets the, he gets the most intense pleasure from having to hold it in because whenever he tries to go to the bathroom, it's always, there's always someone in there. But yes, the persecuting thing is is is, a, is very important, right? The, um, as we we talked about in the in the in the Marx chapter in liberal economy, right? You've got the old man persecuting Marx, and the the little girl Marx who is fetishizing a kind of organic unity to capital or to or to the working class, the proletariat, whatever this. And he says. Um, Having studied a series of cases of delusion of persecution, I and also others have developed the impression that the relationship of the patient to his persecutor can be solved according to a simple formula. The person to whom the delusion ascribes such great power and influence and in whose hands all the threads of the conspiracy are brought together is, if given a specific identity, the same one as was no less important for the emotional life of the patient before the onset of the illness or an easily recognized surrogate. So this is that, this is how that not only I assume Schraber's gratefulness to being cured the first time by Fleshy, but also as we know, his wife's intense Gratitude. gratefulness and who knows, maybe she was fucking Fleshy on the side. She's got, his, she's got his picture on his desk, right? Almost like you would have a likeness of God to like, yeah. I was think, thinking about that like earlier, I didn't image. mention that, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Like if you were Catholic and had an image of Christ or something in the home. No, I totally that agree. Prominence, with that. at least that like signification element, right? Or probably like lends itself towards this neuroses. This yeah, neuro- so it's, or yeah. Neuro- neurotic vision of Fleischig is as the father of God. Right. So you you, ha- you and your wife are both at least the wife we know, but I assume Schreiber too. You have this emotional charge, this affect of gratefulness. So the so Fleischig is at first this loved doctor. Eight years later, he goes back in. He's much worse. His delusions have, have become grand, if you want to say it that way. <laughs> and Freud says, so you have you have the first stage, right? The simple formula. You have the first stage of this of this hypercathexis, hyperinvestment into a person with love, transference, whatever you want to call it, and. And then it turns into its opposite, right? It, it reverses course. The, the, at least the, the tone, the effective uh, pole of it reverses course. And I think that that's important because I think Freud's main thing for Fleshig to take on such greatness as being God or, or, or being the ultimate persecutor, he already had to have been charged by Schreber. Schreber already had to have invested a lot. That doesn't come out of nothing that... Um, you know, and this is how we define, this is how later in a, uh, you know, he only starts to talk about it here, but, it, but in a few years, he'll start to formulate the ego ideal and, and the super ego in these kind of terms too, right? In these terms of, of, um, of a kind of persecuting agency, an agency of self-observation that's also a, an agency of hypercriticism and how it, it, it is the kind of reservoir of these past identifications, you know, specifically the father, you know, because a lot of that's Freud, but it, it could be also this older brother, right, that, that we learn is two years older than, than Schreber, who, who, who killed himself. Um, you know, 
it's obviously too Freud wants to tell us a little bit about Schraber's genetic history because we know that the the that Schraber's father kind of fell into a depression and died in a in a fairly uh, pitiful way. Let's just say Schraber's brother kills himself, so it, it totally makes sense that Schraber would you know that that pathological mental illness kind of runs in the family. It seems right. I mean. I know this is like the most basic and least like theoretical stuff, but it's interesting biographically. Yeah. What do you think about in terms of like sublimation for Freud? Because isn't like the pop sort of understanding of sublimation is like more like sublation versus like, because sublimation is, has something to do with more like sublime, right? In terms of the root, concept yes, or root yeah, not, origin not, or like etymological no. etymologically yes so it's 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 like up to the limit right it's like it's kind of uh it's kind of like you think of the infinitesimal so to speak right approaching approaching a limit asymptotically and i think this gets back to what we only briefly talked about last time when we discussed beyond the pleasure principle when i said that lacan has that essay about the Freudian dialectic and the Hegelian dialectic, right? I mean, the, the Hegelian dialectic sublation or alpha bung, right? Sometimes translated as suspension, something's canceled out and raised up, right? It's, um, it's, it's, it's neither positive or negative. It kind of has like a lot of German words, a lot of basic German words. It has, it has both meanings. With Freud, when he talks about sublimation, you know, his main thing is wanting to discuss ways in which ways in which the sexual drives find outlets that aren't always immediately uh, connected to some sort of external object like a like a woman's vagina or let's just say like one's own body and narcissism and and and, and masturbation right that that for him the sexual charges don't necessarily have to be discharged in a normal way like coming right and this obviously the guitar talking about don't come yet and all this stuff we can we've talked about some of this but um but for freud right so you invest the all the, this 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 damming up of all the sexual energy it becomes invested in in culture in in like the german sense culture right like civilization and this is how we this explains some of the most prodigious achievements of human community, you know, art, even science, just these higher sort of mental aspirations are, this is diverted sexual libido. And I think this is why Deleuze and Guattari want to say like, look, you can see as much sexuality in a, in a prostitute with her John as with a mathematician and his proofs, right? That there's, there's an equal amount of sexuality, if not sometimes more, depending on how you measure the charges right that i think for freud too he wants to say that there's a with the man of science for example there is this interplay between the pleasure principle and the reality principle because in science we are pushing the reality principle and reality testing to a certain limit and trying to organize how we interact with the external world and refining the the lost object etc and putting it in its place and so science defers an immediate type of pleasure for Really, I mean, in a, in a Leotardian sense, in a libidinal economy sense, in, in the prospects of even greater pleasure in the future, while also mastering phenomena, mastering external reality, which, it, which in and of itself, I think, has this pleasurable uh, charge or discharge, really. The reason I asked was I was thinking about um, basically Freud's diagnosis, right, is that probably fucking up the terminology, but it's like either either Schreber's sublated or sublimated, and I, I don't know which is correct, homosexual desire for the father and brother gets transferred over to this these delusions. Right. So is that, that's like sublim, no, that's like sublation, right? Am I just getting those reversed or? He actually does bring up, he, he uses the word alphabung or alphaben, at least once in the essay, and I wish I could find it immediately. Damn, I didn't recall that. Yeah, um, I, don't, well, I don't have control F on my PDF, or I would. I don't. I don't think Strakey points it out. I 
I, I was looking at the German too when I was reading some of the stuff. Um, it's not in a footnote or anything, is it? No, no. no. Uh, but I will say about sublimation, on the one hand... Right, because I think, right, isn't that like the pop, like whenever people think of sublimation, it feels like in the sort of pop Freudian sense, it's not what Freud really meant by sublimation. And again, like I said, I could be mixing up sublation and sublimation because they're so close in terms of spelling. But. There, there, are, there, are, there are a few times, there are a few times in, in Freud where he uses the term alpha bung and alpha, alpha haben and, and, and the like, alpha hoben and those different, uh, but, but there's never a citation to Hegel and, and the word itself could, is a very common, it's an everyday German word. I mean, Freud and Hegel are great and, and, and other of these great classical German writers, they're using everyday language in, in ways that just become sediment. Uh, here, here we go. Here's, here's good. So he talks about, I mean, this, this would be the, the, the quickest way to talk about sublimation. So you've got, you've got this erotic charge towards a sexual object. And for whatever reason, the relations are inhibited there. There, he gives a number of reasons why it's inaccessibility, dangers of, normal general sexual relations etc and um and he talks he's talking about schraber's homosexual charges this this damning up of homosexual libido either towards fleshing remnants towards the brother father and as i said earlier the orderlies which is something freud ignores right this this notion that schraber's first sexual abuse as a woman as this becoming woman will be at the hands of this kind of gang rape scene he says, Intis intensive participation in those general in interests of humanity that have arisen through the sublimation of eroticism. So he's talking about really, I mean, this comes back to sum it up. He's saying it's natural for those, especially these men with a propensity for male homosexual relations to be to become artists, to be, to sublimate those, that erotic drive and to create culture. One of the first times he really talks about sublimation and starts to use that term is with his kind of reading of Leonardo da Vinci and Leonardo da Vinci's sort of homosexual proclivities and why, you know, these homosexual tendencies that he couldn't necessarily act, act out on or act on in a way that would be you know, confluent with quote unquote, you know, polite society drove him to become one of the most creative human beings we are aware of in the past five centuries. So I'm not exactly sure about the, the pop interpretation of, of Freud, but, but it does kind of boil down to that, right? That, that, you know, erotic charges, discharges through normal pathways, normal sexual pathways, uh, are inhibited, but that energy has to go somewhere. Yeah. At least, at least in successful sublimation, that energy goes somewhere and it, it invests into culture, into art, into science, into philosophy, into thinking, it, but also into other manners of manipulating the external world and failing that when that energy doesn't have anywhere to go when it builds up, then we start to get all kinds of, then bad things happen when sublimation itself is not available as a discharge, then again, it's like, it's like too much pressure builds up too much, too much energy begins to the brain, so to speak, he wouldn't say that he'd say the cycle apparatus, then almost turns back upon itself and repression heightens these other complexes heighten. And for Freud, that itself is a kind of, it's a charging and a discharging system because it takes a lot more energy in the Freudian kind of economical theory. It takes a lot more energy to repress than to lift a repression. And so when that energy doesn't have anywhere to go, it, it invests more intensely into these, these neurotic, paranoid formations, et cetera. But he says, he says the word Alphahoben one time in the third chapter on the paranoid mechanisms, when he says, to what further use is the libido that has become free through detachment put? This is precisely the question of sublimation that you brought up. 
And he says, normally we straight away seek a substitute for the connection that has been lifted. And the word lifted there is Alf Gehoven, that has been sublated. Until this substitution has succeeded, the free libido is left suspended in the psyche where it produces tensions and influences mood. In hysteria, the liberated portion of the libido transforms itself into bodily innervations or into anxiety and yada, yada, yada. So in that sense, your, your sensitivity to the relation between sublimation and sublation, Freud just there in describing sublimation and how it works and how it fails too. He, um, he says normally with sublimation, we, when we don't have say a pussy to fuck, whatever is the object to discharge our erotic libido to when that's not available, we seek a substitute mm-hmm. and you can see like there's a whole series of substitutes and he'll get to this in civilization of his discontents, but there's a whole series of sub- substitutes that, that leads to what I've been talking about with proper sublimation through culture. When we detach, when that energy, when, when that inhibition has been lifted, we seek a substitute. And so it's sublimation and sublima- sublation would in Freudian terminology have interplay. I just don't think Freud wants to put the, the stank or the emphasis on that word, on, on Hegel's gotcha. word. And I believe the German that, that he, the German of, for sublimation, I think comes back to the Latin. I think it's like sublimiren is to sub, sublimate. Whereas Hegel is using standard German with Alf Haven. So they have also, they have different etymological roles and maybe Freud is thinking through Hegel. I believe he is, as we just showed. Freud is thinking through Hegel's sublation, but he's giving it his own twist. He's relating it to the drives, to the, this energetic model. And he chooses a Latin word just so we don't get confused, right, with, with, with Hegel's notion. So it, it has its own distinct Freudian personality. Did we read this bit about, uh, here's a quote, the son, therefore, is nothing but another sublimated symbol for the father and in pointing this out, I must disclaim all responsibility for the monotony of the solutions provided by psychoanalysis. In this instance, symbolism overrides grammatical gender, at least so far as German goes. For the other language, the son is masculine, and mm-hmm. its counterpart in is this picture of the two parents is Mother Earth. No, that's good. I And I then so perfect. it goes, uh, yeah, because you mentioned, I think, uh, just going linguistically, I think it is interesting that German specifically is perhaps uh, maybe a relative um, outsider in gendering the sun as feminine in terms of linguistic. Right. Yeah. D D zona, I believe, right. It, it would be a feminine. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with insofar as the sun in Schraber's delusions is the, is one of the principal symbols for, for the rays of God. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with that. And also, German grammar is more fascinating than romantic grammar because it doesn't have just masculine and feminine right. cases. It's got new gender neuter. neuter yeah. Yeah. But it's good to talk about a sublimated symbol of the father being the son. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was getting at is this. Yeah. The way that this, these sexual feelings are sublimated and go in ter- terms of like that being the genesis of this sort of delusional or this whole series of delusions that he descends into. But again, I think maybe that's that's like the pop Freudian <laughs> reading, perhaps. Well, it's um, I think it is important, right? I mean, like you do a lot with this question of this of the sublimated symbol of the father. I mean, as I talked a little bit about the biography, you know, his father seems like a fucking terrifying figure. <laughs> yeah. and, and as I said, he was, you know, until Schraber's memoirs, he was he was more famous than Schraber with those 30 books on gymnastics and whatnot. And um, even, even until the thirties parents would, would threaten their children with using one of Schraber's apparatuses, right? The, the strict, you know, seated posture, head clamped in, you know, you can imagine a a kind of a electric chair type thing. All you would need is a little bit of current to to shock the, the, the child. But yeah, God or, or the son or even Fleshig himself, there are all these substitutes. I mean, that's what I think is very important for Freud. Even when he uses this note, the language of sublimated simple, Freud's always interested in 
a series of substitutes, right? You start, and this is why he wants to start with uh, the family. Would that be so, like, and maybe I'm jumping ahead, yeah, uh, ahead. but like a symbolic chain of right, signifiers, yeah, signif- chain of signifiers, chain. or signifying right. chain, yeah, right. And you know, Lacan is 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 very specific in how metaphor and metonymy work in these these uh, in this realm of substitutions and associations. And Freud himself, too, even though he doesn't use that language, that Caesarian language, because it's anachronistic or partially, right? Uh, he doesn't use that structuralist language. He still has this concrete idea of the series of metonymic substitutions or surrogates, ersatz, right, in German, which we have that word, too. Although when we use ersatz in English, we usually mean it pejoratively, right? It's a knockoff. And, and, and it's not a bad it's not a bad thing to keep that in mind, too, in Freud, because, you know, the levito might see each substitution and surrogate as a kind of as a kind of knockoff. But it all depends on the formation. Right. Because with the paranoic formation, what could be more true than the ultimate substitution of of God as the primary and primordial persecutor of, of flesh of, of his soul and and threatening him with with castration, with soul castration, with soul murder, you know, so, but this question of substitutions and surrogates for Freud is, is always so important because it's, it speaks to one of the elements, one of the four elements of, of the drive, right? It speaks to the role of the object and, and for the drive, the object is totally contingent. In some ways it's kind of arbitrary, but in a specific sense, right? It, it doesn't come pre made it's not it's always a kind of ad hoc solution if you will right there's no primordial object towards which the drive or through which the drive discharges itself so in that sense that when when freud is always talking about substitutes and surrogates these sublimated symbols and the, the chain whatever it's always because the first object you know a love object the first love object is really the subject's own body through narcissism but but these things always get the displaced and the and and one object can fit in for another given the inhibition of certain channels and certain pathways and i think that that's the logic of sublimation that sublimation in, already implies that there's a whole series of substitutions and i think that for freud it's a you know this part of the discontents if you will of the libido but it's also what makes civilization it, 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 it possible all political economy is libidinal economy, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, that's a very, that's a little, that's a nice little connection, right? I think so. I, I do. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's also what, you know, the, the, the thing about Lacan, you, you want new masters, you will have them, right? You're seeking these new father figures or these new, uh, those who would have power over you, right? You're substituting, you're merely substituting. I think that's what Lacan, I think it's actually less insidious, it may still be cynical, but it's less insidious and less nasty when you think that Lacan is talking about that there will always be a kind of transcendental phallus, a transcendental signified or signifier, depending on if you're Derridian or Lacanian, whatever you want to say, that 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 hangs over the whole series of chains right. uh, of signifying chains. So you take down one phallus and you put up another. Is that how, moved outside the field? Does that have anything to do with names of the father? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, and, and really, and we haven't been doing it in the Lacanian sense, but the whole Schreber case is 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 a Freudian kind of names of the father type deal that we've been dealing with, right? This mm-hmm. this question of fleshig, this question of of God, but God subdivided into higher and lower, you know, and so he's at odds with himself and kind of in conflict, even in his unity, and and you oh, know, for Schreber. For Schreber, this whole thing is that God is threatened in his self-preservative drives, that there is this threat to God, and Schreber is both the threat to God's unity because of because God can't detach from him, right? Because Schreber's field of intensities, but at the same time, those those fields of intensities and voluptuousness also is what God demands. So there's this interesting vacillation between God himself being threatened in his existence and Schreber's desire to have God's children, right? It is kind of that Hegelian Lacanian thing where the universe is, no, I think it might be Sartre. The universe is, is, is a flaw in the purity of non-being, right? So there's this, 
there is this pure extinction, which you brought up with, with, with um, Azatoth, right? Right. Yeah. The, the, like, like there is this threat to existence as a whole. And I think that Schreber has to have it both ways, right? That there is this sense, and it's in a footnote, but he basically says there's, there's been this moral rot. It's kind of similar to the way God totally destroyed all life specifically to get rid of the humans because of their moral failings. There's something similar uh, with Schreber too, right? That, that there has been this new flood, you know, it doesn't have to be literally water, right? It's this metaphorical right. moral degeneration. Yeah. And this is why he has to become woman. This is why, but the becoming woman is primary. It's the secondary aspect that's, that's redeeming humanity and recreating humans from, uh, you know, from God. And, um, but it does seem that, that Schreber makes it out that, that humanity itself and this reproduction through this voluptuousness, through this constant need for enjoyment that he sees on behalf of God, that that itself is, is, is God's own, that's the gap, that's the threat, right? And severing that continuous enjoyment also threatens God's self-preservation. So there's this dance being done between humans being created, God getting his sources of intensity and ecstasy. It's perfect that you mentioned this like state of enjoyment that's mm-hmm. required by God, because I want to read this quote and then just go off a little bit of a tangent. On the other hand, God demands a constant state of enjoyment, such as would be in keeping with the conditions of existence imposed upon souls by the order of things. And then he says, it is in my duty to provide him with this. And uh, what this led me to was this notion of the like super egoic injunction to enjoy. Mm, yes. Well, yeah, Khan yeah, here. Right. Right. Like Khan's enjoy your symptom. I mean, and I think that, 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 that the only reason why we don't find something akin to that directly in Freud is precisely because Lacan, as you know, was working primarily with psychotics and is able to derive that kind of axiomatic formulation mm-hmm. through that, through patients like Schreber and, and, and such. Whereas Freud is working with neurotics and their types of, you know, I think for Freud, this notion of enjoying your symptom, I almost feel like, again, it seems when you reduce it like that, it makes Lacan seem like such a fucking asshole. And maybe by, <laughs> maybe to a certain point he is, maybe he is more of an asshole than Freud oh, I mean, to, yeah. to a certain extent. I mean, I would, th- <laughs> but I, in I would context, not be shocked by that. Uh, I mean, you know, in context, sure. Lacan has a, has a theoretical point to make. I just don't think Freud, Freud's notion of pleasure, unpleasure as related to hysterias and other neuroses, I can't imagine him saying something like that. Enjoy your symptom in the sense of jouissance, in the sense in which Lacanian enjoyment is is not simply Freudian pleasure. Does that make sense? Yeah. I do think that Freud gets, I don't know, say improved upon, but you can see a kind of differentiation with, with Lacan bringing in this notion of jouissance, this notion of enjoyment. I don't think Freud would be able to make that logical leap by saying that the outcome of analysis with quote unquote, the talking cure, the cure for uh, neurotics would be for them to, to enjoy their symptom. I think that he wouldn't, I think that that would be furthest from Freud's point because he, he details the suffering and the, and the difficulties that they, they have to go through. I mean, on the other hand, he does talk about a secondary benefit from illness. So there are elements that Lacan seizes upon in Freud to, to, to be able to, to eke it out. It's just, you know, that kind of pronouncement is bold. It's bold in the Freudian framework. The way that I always read that super egoic injunction is in the context of capitalism would be the providing the injunction, like you must enjoy. Mm -hmm. Right. And that being kind of the, the mantra, if you will, of capital to enjoy, to seek enjoyment. And that being kind of like the, on the individual level, the driving logic of, consumerism right or whatever like sublate sublating or sublimating these desires into commodities right etc yeah yeah i mean it does show that that one of the things lacan updates in freud is is 
is molding, modeling him more for a psychoanalysis that is in tune with and attuned to the to libidinal economy proper in the modern sense, in the sense of capitalism. Not that Freud doesn't have his moments where he, un- he understands that. Yeah, I just don't necessarily know. If those elements are already found in uh, Freud. We can see that Lacan takes them further. And I think that's partly what Leotard is trying to himself point to with his own um, way of, of focusing on Freud and, and, and Marx. We talked about a majority of the stuff, we, you know, um, there is obviously much more to delve into, but for a kind of a first crack, I felt like we were able to, you know, to suss out some of the, some of the important things. Well, this will be the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry signing off for the week. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a block work orange.